Hi everyone, it's really a pleasure to be here and I really want to thank my uh, colleagues uh, Katja and Sara to invite us to give this talk and uh, to tell you you know, what we have been learning about uh, PrEP and HIV prevention among adolescents for the past uh, five years. And when they asked us to talk about our PrEP 1519 project, uh, we, we included the title in a way as we like to think of research in terms of public health in Brazil. And you see here, it's building the bridges between research, health service, and use because it's our target population, more actually adolescent population. And I would include here another word, which is teaching, because we have in our project several students, grad undergraduate and graduate students as well. So PrEP 1519 phase one uh, was a demonstration cohort study co-funded by UNITAID with a, a funding agents based in Geneva, very much connected with WHO, and also the Brazilian public health system. Brazil, Brazil has a national health system, which is taxpayer, taxpayers' money and has universal access to everyone in Brazil. And this study was implemented in three large capital cities, Salvador in the Northeast, where I'm based and several um, people from our team is here, you can wave. And also from Sao Paulo, we have the PI, uh, Dr. Alexandre Granzer there from Sao Paulo and Marcia Couto as well as in the team um, with this research. Um, our main um, focus on, of this PrEP 1519, and as you're going to see, it's called PrEP 1519 because our target age group is from 15 to 19 years old. It was to demonstrate PrEP effectiveness because we knew from various studies that PrEP works. But how about its PrEP works with adolescents in the real world and context of adolescents, especially vulnerable adolescents. That's what we, uh, our goal to address. But you can see that within the main aim, we had several components of our study and these components were turned into sub-studies and then into uh, publications. And you see demand creates the strategy recruitment is very important how we went about to recruit adolescents, the evaluation of distribution of HIV self-test and use, the estimation of HIV incidence based on prevalence data, uh, using the avidity tests to figure out how many new infections we had at baseline, but we also have um, the estimation of HIV throughout the cohort. We have a cost effectiveness study going on, the analysis, and also we build um, a study on sexual practice and self care among the adolescents during COVID 19. We built a contingency plan during the pandemic. We never stop our, our service in these two sites, in Salvador and Sao Paulo, because a lot of service care and prevention of HIV in the health system in Brazil, it closed it for some time and really had a huge impact in the population. You can imagine among adolescents. So we never closed our, our sites because adolescents had a, a tunnel to communicate with the health profession, especially in terms of, of mental health. So uh, the inclusion criteria, we had several, but I just wanted to focus on you. The inclusion criteria in our, in our project, I told you about uh, the target popular, uh, the target age group, the sites, um, they uh, self-identify as a transgender woman or uh, men have sex with men. Of course, to be enrolled in PrEP, they had to be HIV neg negative. And in this, uh, a portion of the slide is, in context of increased vulnerability of risk to HIV. You can see here uh, some of the indicators of um, HIV vulnerability. So uh, the question first uh, we ask, are sexual and gender minority adolescents hard to reach 
or hard to engage in HIV prevention. They are not easy to reach, not to engage, because these are health uh, young people, and most of them don't have a health need. So they are not used to go um, to a health center because we usually go to a health center if we have a health need. And PrEP is a prevention, not a treatment, right? So um, we had some challenges in how to go about reaching adolescents. And nowadays, social interactions are mostly online. I'm from the time that so we sit on the couch and talk and maybe watch TV, but this doesn't happen anymore. No, the social interactions are happening online, especially among young people. Stigma and discrimination related to sexual orientation and then gender identity are barriers to health service access and HIV prevention. In political context in Brazil, there is a growing wave of religion conservatives, not only in Brazil, but in many places of the world, and it does impact in HIV prevention and care. We have a goal to end the HIV epidemic, as we all know, but we still have a way to go in terms of really uh, take care of stigma and discrimination and how to really implement um, all the great, great HIV prevention measures that, that we have. How can we create demand for PrEP and STI service for adolescents in this complex context? And we develop a series of strategies to really um, reach out the adolescents. So we train peer educators. They were very active online and offline. We started even before the pandemic to develop some online activities, but this really was important uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so we went to different venues, LGBTQ and my venues. Uh, recruitment in schools, this was before COVID, but this is coming out in the next phase of our studies. So we really carry out lots of workshops um, that include sexual education and sexual health discussions. Referral from the Brazilian uh, uh, service, referral from NGOs that work with adolescents and with HIV care and prevention. We work with the dating apps. Uh, you're gonna see in a moment uh, what we have developed to work in the apps by indication of the so-called word of mouth. And we develop a transgender chatbot, Amanda Self. The, my first slide is one of the pictures of Amanda Self and I'll talk more in detail about her in a moment. This is just to tell you that the photos and images are credited to our um, team work and that we have permissions in the photos um, to show you. So environment really matters, especially working with adolescents that usually face discrimination from sometimes from health providers. Not all have health providers uh, have are discriminatory, but sometimes they are, especially when they see LGBTQ and uh, sexual gender minority adolescents. So in both our, in most of our sites, or all of our sites, we really redesigned the space to be a friendly space and to embrace adolescents. And even for PrEP, when we started uh, back five years ago, PrEP was not something the adolescents really knew. And taking a pill every day, uh, let's face it, it's not easy, right? So as you see here, uh, the little uh, mascot preples here in, in pink and blue, we turn the peel, right? The, the, the prep you, it's the blue peel, and we turn into this crochet mascot to say to adolescents, look, prep can be friendly. So we try to really get this uh, communication across. And here you see um, our um, peer educators, um, you know, they built some um, times where they they dress in a fun way to talk to adolescents about HIV prevention. There's a, here is a drum group uh, of transgender men, and, and you see the environment here that even the walls were painted in a way that they could feel uh, really welcome. Um, this is a tour guide of our clinic. We like to think of our uh, clinic beyond a clinical care, but a, an environment where they have they come to a nice reception, then they see a multi-professional team 
Um, then they go for the lab work, then to the physician's office until the PrEP dispensation. This is a photo uh, of the historical site in Salvador. Katja and Sara have been there and have seen, um, have experienced uh, with this area in Brazil. And you are all invited to go there. It's a very friendly environment. Um, now I, I, I move on to our implementation model, which includes recruiting, link, and rolling adolescent management and adolescent transgender women, not only in PrEP, but PrEP is a great opportunity to integrate STI service and other services as well. So we use this mixed model of, of differentiated service delivery. It's very much a model from WHO that includes how, who, where, and what? What do we provide? How do we go about? And I told you that we, uh, with many uh, uh, demand creation strategies, and from the demand created strategy, online and offline, and communication materials, uh, then we recruit them in the prep clinic, and we have a train of health professionals. And these are the services that we provide. You see here many services that I'll tell you in a, in a, in a, in more detail for the STIs and HIV uh, testing, but also condom dispensation, psychological support, um, treatment, uh, uh, point of care for STIs, and. After COVID, during COVID and after COVID, we include a series of telehealth services that is being going on until now. So making connections is important. This is just some photos. We created a persona uh, to be in the dating apps. Um, again, several flyers, fans, posters that funds to adolescents. We have a comic here where you see prepions, which means little prep in Brazil using uh, some images from our own culture. And actually we develop um, in our uh, list of connections, a game uh, which in, in, engage adolescents in the game uh, in order to tell them about prep and how to read the clinics. And Amanda Self is the first transgender chat boat in Latin America developed to address PrEP and STI issues among youth. She was available 24 by seven in Facebook Messenger. She communicates with youth um, about um, sensitive issues on uh, gender identity and prevention. And through a quiz, she identify adolescents at most HIV risk and schedule appointments in Google Calendar and interact. And if they enroll in PrEP, she interacts with them to reinforce retention and adherence. Um, more on our demand creation materials. Salvador, it's it's the summertime is really special. And you see here, we use the popsicle as something to start the conversation with adolescents. We launch our table in the beach, starting to talk to them, um, to adolescents that were interested in PrEP. And even from the beach, if they were interested, some of our peer educators would take them to the clinic. And uh, here at schools, uh, we had fun games and play for activities to discuss sexualities with youth. Uh, of course, we are online. We use uh, Boost in, in Instagram and we have our own uh, Instagram page. And there is a great capture of your Boost uh, post in Instagram. Instagram is something that we learn a lot throughout our of time doing this research. And it's, it, and it's a strategy to organize the online research. We offer in the adolescents a very fun pouch, as you can see here. It a, includes a prevention kit to create demand and inform about HIV prevention and PrEP. And if they are interested in being enroll in PrEP or in PrEP or even enroll in other HIV prevention activities, they come to the clinic and we give them the pouch. Um, so now I'll move on to tell more you about the design and some data of PrEP 1519. 
Uh, so the call heard, it was started in February 2019, and we end in terms of, of data analysis either in 2021 and, or February 2022, which completes three years of follow-up. So we started with recruitment and screening, and then we see, and we have same day prep initiation. Um, so the first, then go for the first visit uh, to enrollment and the, the baseline. Uh, and here we provide same day prep initiation. Then the second visit after one month, because this first month period, it's very important in terms of make sure that people really understand what PrEP is and if you're there taking in, in uh, the expected uh, manner. Then uh, that is the second visit and then quarterly visit uh, after that. In terms of STI testing, we provided a series of STI testing, uh, the serology for hepatitis A, B, and C, rapid tests for syphilis, and if, if they were uh, positivity, we carry on for more tests. We provided auto rectum and urethra swabs for you or urine samples um, for nucleic acid amplification to test for chlamydia and gonorrhea, but we're also we test for urea plasma, we test for HPV at baseline in every six months or as clinically indicated. If there was an indicator for more testing, we carry out. And the prevalence of gonorrhea and chlamydia consider the infections in the three sites because we did some comparison. And if you only do one site, you miss, you miss the whole story. And participants with an indication were referred to hepatitis vaccination, but the coverage of hepatitis B vaccination among adolescents in Brazil tend to be high. So a bit of PrEP 15, 19 data, just to give you a feeling of, of what we uh, have accomplished. Uh, so this is the largest adolescent cohort study in PrEP. So from this three year period of follow-up, we have 12, 16 um, enrolled adolescents. And you see here that you, we have a small number called non-PREP, not that we have a two, two R, but to accommodate those that were not ready to PREP at the first time, we provide them also all the other HIV prevention. And if at any time during the follow-up, they wanted to be in PREP, then we enrolled them in PREP. We had more, uh, men as men than transgender women, but compared to other studies, it's a pretty uh, okay number for transgender women. More of those 18 to 19 years old is really a challenge to enroll young adolescent. And um, we, the lesson here is that we reach it, we need to reach much more young people, adolescents to include them in PrEP. And you can, this is the, QR code for the uh, paper that we have on our demand creation strategy. And 18% of those that we reach were enrolled in PrEP. The HIV baseline, at, uh, HIV prevalence at baseline was 5% and is high for this uh, young population. And you see here very high prevalence of other STIs. And PrEP program is an excellent opportunity, as I told you, to test and treat other STIs. And you see high incidence rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia in this young population. Here is the uh, sort of conversion data that we have. So throughout the two years of follow-up, we have eight uh, sort of conversions. And this yielded an HIV incidence rate of 1.64 per 100 person years. It's, it's somewhat higher than what we expected and most happened during the pandemic, but compared to the rates of other uh, cohort, adolescent cohort, ours is somewhat lower. In the adherence here uh, in our study, we had different measures of adherence in our study. This one that I'm showing you is by the medication possession rates. And if you have 53% uh, uh, MPR is moderate, and if you have 90%, you have high adherence. And here you see that throughout the cohort, um, so adherence tended to be high, 
but also um, we have less people um, in the cohort because in this next slide, I'm showing you that PrEP discontinuation among adolescents, it is an issue. And we have close to 50% of discontinuation. Here's the Kaplan-Meier curve, as you see it here. And um, looking at different comparisons, uh, the indicators that show that um, transgender women has more discontinuation, uh, those with uh, um, has sex with an HIV infected uh, partner um, have less discontinuation. And if the risk perception for HIV is low, then there is more discontinuation. In terms of governance, uh, PrEP 15 has articulated several sectors of the Brazilian society, include the health sectors, but also the judiciary system, as we had to include um, adolescents, young adolescents, 15 to 17 years old in our study. So we had to really partner with the judiciary system. But we also part with the World Health Organization, the Pan American health organization to promote HIV and STI prevention based on the new technologies that we develop. And the Minister of Health provided all the medications for our study, auto prep. And uh, our study was, the, the data that we produced in our study was very important in terms of governance because the Minister of Health use of our data uh, to convince the health authorities change the age range. So PrEP now is offered for those free of charge um, in the PrEP SUS for program started at 15 years old. And here's the, uh, the new, the revised PrEP guidelines. Uh, also, we contribute to um, information for WHO uh, publications. During COVID, uh, we... Um, um, contribute to a series of experience and including telehealth is in, uh, here, as you see in the right side. And we uh, also are part of uh, um, guidelines from WHO, this one in integrating STI services with PrEP, and we are part of um, a group of members for uh, long-acting injectable cabotegravir for HIV prevention. And um, here I almost done with my presentations, but we have been published uh, uh, the results of our study. This is a special issue in one of our journals, the report in public health. You can also, um, we have here the QR code for this whole issue, so you can access. And we're gonna have in upcoming November 16, another special issue in the Journal of Adolescent Health. Uh, so other publications, including about Amanda Self, how we went about it was it's a lot of work to develop uh, uh, an intelli artificial intelligence. It doesn't start uh, uh, <laughs> as an intelligent tool. It takes a lot of work to become intelligent. Um, here, Fabiane Soad is here. She's the lead of this article on important step um, for PrEP uptake, acceptability of daily PrEP um, among adolescents. Uh, we have also publications during COVID-19 and a study on, on already uh, interest and acceptability of, of uh, long acting injectable PrEP, which is going to be our next study. So I'm giving you some uh, spoiler on the on the next phase of our study. So now it's called PrEP 1519 Choices because uh, in this next phase, our study is going to be the evaluator of implementation PrEP protocol with three modalities, daily auto PrEP, on-demand PrEP, and long-acting PrEP, uh, long-acting PrEP using uh, cabotegravy. So I wanted to finalize uh, just thanking the great teams that we have in all of our sites. And you see here the uh, group from, from, from Sao Paulo, here a group from Salvador, and also thank the sponsors um, uh, and many other people that make this study possible and the funding uh, from Unitate. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. 
So uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, for coming here, especially during the lunch time. It's not mm -hmm. easy to do this. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a, a, a very good English like Dr. Inez, but I will try to speak English and I prepare some words because of this. Uh, and uh, I will uh, share with you some data about our study in Brazil. Uh, take it TQT study. Uh, the name of the, this presentation is Expanded Testing Surveillance Strategy to Fight Against the COVID-19 Pandemic in Brazil. I will share with you some preliminary results of this study, but before I would like uh, to share some context. As you know, Brazil uh, was affected disproportionately by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially because a wrong negationist policy adopted by the last Brazilian government. And uh, we will always remember the images of people suffering without oxygen in Manaus, in Amazon. Uh, Brazil is a rich, rich country with extensive regional and social inequalities. This photo, could represent one of, of the worst characters of Brazil, the social inequalities. On the one hand, as you know, as you see here in this picture, rich people live in good conditions. On the other hand, poor people sometimes live in terrible situations. And intersectional factors are linked to social inequalities, such as racism, and gender inequalities. So fortunately, we have uh, this big system called Sistema Único de Saúde, the Brazilian public health system, which is responsible for providing free access, health assistance to all Brazilian citizens. And this system was a victory conquered by the Brazilian sanitary and social activists which included social movements, universities, professors, students, and the whole populations during the formulations of our national constitution in 1980, after the dictator military regime. So in this context uh, of Brazilian public health system, we conducted the TQT study with the main objective uh, to implement testing, quarantine, telemonitoring strategies, and prevention of COVID-19 uh, at primary healthcare system. Select uh, in highly vulnerable socioeconomic neighborhoods in two largest Brazilian capital cities. Uh, it was Salvador and Rio de Janeiro. So we created a vast study protocol with qualitative formative research and four com components nested within of the COVID-19 test intervention. The first one was the uh, implementation of the testing, isolation, quarantine, and telemonitoring strategies in the primary healthcare system services for six months the second was the performance of uh, two rapid tests. Uh, the third one was a monitor of the new variants and subvariants of SARS-CoV-2. And the fourth was the study of acceptability and usability of self-testing. We had a lot of uh, secondary objectives related to access to vaccines, testing acceptability, behaviors related to prevention measures, implementation of a strategy of telemonitoring and demand creation to testing. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to details. As you can see here uh, is, is our protocol paper, which you have more details of this study. Uh, we had two sites in this uh, study. One site was uh, in Salvador, 
uh, we conduct this study in 17 primary health care services uh, in Cabula, Beiru. Uh, it is a district in Salvador, uh, where my university, State University of Bahia, is, um, uh, uh, is there. Uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro, in two primary health care units, in Manguinho, where is, uh, Fiocruz is based. So uh, this uh, intervention was structured in three subcomponents. Training, the first one was training health professional teams. The second was recruiting and demand creations. And the third one was the TQT strategy, which was testing isolation, quarantine, and telemonitoring strategies. So uh, it, it is our uh, demand creation. We had a lot of demand strategies of demand creations uh, with active, active search in the community and passive search that was uh, based on people who needed to test it can also go directly to the primary health care units. So uh, we have a lot of uh, strategies of telemonitoring. Uh, the people, uh, the primary health care teams telemonitor people with COVID-19 uh, through the TQT platform those who have comorbidities were follow up, follow up every 24 hours, and those who did not were follow up every four eight hours. These professionals uh, contacted patients to monitor disease evolution. Patients with no electronic equipment or in internet access were monitored face to face in the communities. The test results were available to participants through the TQT ROM page and the app linked to this platform. This was uh, our digital platform. Health professionals have uh, conducted manual monitoring of COVID-19 positive cases before these interventions. And with the project, we developed a digital platform to facilitate this work, including a real-time surveillance dashboard. Uh, these platforms uh, features different interfaces for uh, health workers. Uh, for example, uh, they, they do uh, situation analysis with the situation of, of distribution of positive cases, contacts, and deaths by geographic areas, monitoring and access to results. And for community residents, uh, for example, test results, access, vaccination, monitoring, contacts with the services, and et cetera. So in that show, uh, I, in this slide, I would like to present the roadmap testing. Firstly, uh, the patient was recruited to primary health care clinics through demand creations. We had a lot of demand creation strategies in the community. Everyone was offered to participate in the research by answering questionnaires and collecting swabs. Those who agreed, of course, signed the informed consent form. Then this person was tested, and if positive, he or she was invited to call all close contacts for testing and recommended isolation. And finally, this person was telemonitored until the end of the infection. So now I would like to present some uh, preliminary results uh, of this intervention that started in July 2022 and finished in July 2023. It was conducted in 19 primary healthcare services in Salvador and Rio. Almost 30,000 rapid tests were performed among almost 2,000 uh, uh, people. We have a good uptake of testing, which was 93.8%, and the prevalence of COVID-19 estimated in the study was 90.4%. Here, uh, you can see the demand creation strategies, the most, uh, the most 
a strategy that uh, include most people was healthcare providers, community health agents, and worth of month. Uh, here uh, in this table, you can see the profile of the study population. On the left table, you can see that we recruit a lot of cis women, uh, black, black people uh, with high school, uh, people with a family income uh, between minimum wage or two minimal wages uh, and uh, uh, with a previous 37% uh, have a previous diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, some people, 8.9, have a previous difficult to access of COVID-19 testing with uh, a history of comorbidities was 20%, and some people had experience of discrimination in health service, 6%, and all, almost all people uh, had exclusively public health service access. So in this graph, you can see vaccination uh, data. On the left graph, you can see a high proportion of vaccination in this community, 95% with at least one dose. And on the right graph, you observe a high proportion of first and second boosters among vaccinated people. Maybe for this reason, almost 100% of people had mild or a moderate symptoms and no deaths were res resisted in this study. In this graph, you can see uh, data about the testing. Uh, on the left graph, you can see uh, that almost 30% of the people who had COVID-19 positive tests said they couldn't do a quarantine or isolation time for seven to 10 days. Uh, of course, the people need to work uh, uh, and can't do the isolation or quarantine uh, on this time. And the, on the right graphic, we observe a high rate of refusing COVID-19 testing, almost 6% among those who were indicated in the contract testing by a person who had a positive test. So in this, in this figure, you can observe the most reported personal strategies for prevention. Uh, uh, I, I would like to draw the attention that almost 10% is still reported use ineffective drugs for prevention, like hydroclox, chloroquine, and invermectin. Uh, to final remarks, we learned that uh, this strategy was feasible to implement in this community, mobilization of health providers and community health agents was a very important strategy to demand creation in this context. In general, the people from this community had a high uptake of COVID-19 testing during the intervention. However, they showed moderate uptake among those who closed contacts with someone with a COVID-19 positive test. And finally, uh, we think that this strategy can inspire the face of the new pandemics at the primary health care uh, in Brazil. I would like to say thank you for whole teams that we it's represent here uh, in, uh, with my colleagues uh, and say thank you for you uh, for coming. Thank you.